peoples of African descent and its link to African unity. I can give you a long dissertation, or I could just answer in one quick phrase. What is, what is the relationship between peoples of African descent and Africa? I tell you like this, Africa is your home and your African people. What you decide to do with that is based upon your understanding of where you are and who you are. But the truth is the truth, regardless of what you think. We are African people, and Africa still is our home. I say it like that because sometimes I still run into people to this very day, some people who walk around here acting like they really are conscious, you know. They say they're really conscious, and they say, yeah, I'm African. I know I'm African. And the day I was asking the sister, I said, look, if I take your bag, what would you do? She said, I'm going to struggle to get that bag back. One of them, she said, I'll kick you like that, you know. I said, well, you say you're African. Africa is your land. And you know, what are you doing to get Africa back? She said, I never thought about it like that. <laughs> Africa is not just our ancestral homeland. Africa is not just our spiritual land. Africa is our land, our only land. Africa is our home. And if you don't do anything, if you take no action to help liberate Africa, your inaction is an action against Africa. And your grandchildren will come to say, Grandma, when they hear Africa still colonized under a new form of imperialism called neo-colonialism, that's all that means is new colonialism. When they hear Africa colonized under neo-colonialism, what did you do? And you're going to start saying, well, you know, I was so busy. I had these tests to take when I was in school, and I had my little job I had to work on. I just didn't really have time to deal with it. But you know, the, uh, every time people become more conscious. This generation today is more conscious than our people have ever been. Because people, unlike dogs, have a consciousness. And if you just live from one day to the next, your consciousness will rise. Just by you coming to this room every day, having experience you had on this college campus today, you are more conscious than you were yesterday. A little eight-year-old girl in 1991 is more conscious than a little eight-year-old girl was in 1961. Times are different. A lot of times, the people from the 1960s, all the time, you know, they had this romanticism about the 1960s. You know, when back in the 60s, everything was so live. But this youth today, we've lost this youth. They're just so lost. They're so apathetic. They need to shut up. These youth are much more conscious than the youth in the 1960s. In the 1960s, maybe they did a couple of protests. Maybe they were strongly through some Molotov, Molotov cocktails, etc. But these youth today, hey, you could tell them back in the 60s, you could tell them sitting on the back of the bus, and they go back and sit on the back of the bus. But these youth today, they might sit on the back of the bus, but you can't make them sit on the back of the bus, <laughs> can you? No, I paid my money up front. I'm sitting up front. What you got to do? <laughs> it's just like, you know, society, when society changes, it changes the ideology of the society. So that during the time of slavery, more people, even though inside them they found different ways to resist this slavery, it was more acceptable during the time of slavery. During the time of slavery, if you were European, it would be acceptable for you to have a slave. You might have all kinds of strange ways to justify and rationalize it, but the society will support you. Because if uh, the police and the, and the judges, all of them will implement the system of slavery. It's an economic system. But now, if you talk to these youth today, you say, hey, let me just ask you a question. My sister, if you was alive during the time of slavery, would you have been a slave? No, I wouldn't have been no slave. I told that slave master. <laughs> <laughs> because the consciousness is higher. So three generations from now, the consciousness will be much higher than today. People would be real clear on the question of socialism versus capitalism. They'd be very clear on what is neocolonialism, how does it work, what was its mechanism, et cetera. And they're just going to pose the question very simply. Grandma, back in the 1990s, when Africa was still colonized by neocolonialism, what did you do? You know, just all humbly like this. They're going to be ashamed of it. But if you come to live up the example of some of our greatest figures, people like this sister, Tatina Silla, a sister who gave her life in the armed struggle in Guinea-Bissau, people like a Rosa Parker or Harriet Tubman, Soldier in the Truth, or in Bali and Camarada. These great, we got so many listers, great sisters. But you know, the problem is that when you live in a patriarchal, sexist society, they write sisters out of the history, as though you did nothing. And you know that it's really worse for African sisters, because I'm telling you, for European women in this audience, or, or Indian women, Indian women sank struggles with the Africans. That with the European woman, the woman, the European woman is oppressed by European sexism. That is to say that those European men who are in power in a capitalist society, in a class society, they use that misunderstanding of the relationship between sexes to oppress women. And so women are oppressed in a European society are oppressed by their gender, their sex, and they're oppressed by their class. If you work in a class society, your labor is exploited by those who control the labor. And for African men, African men who live in a society, we're oppressed by, in a capitalist society, we're oppressed because of our race, our, our nation, one form of oppression. We're oppressed because of our class in a class society because of our labor. Because we're in the working class, we're exploited. <coughs> Second contradiction. 
But we African men who oppress twice the slave of a slave, we come to oppress our sisters. Our sisters then are oppressed three times. They have triple oppression. So that African women, if you think European women have been written out of history, then you know African women have been written out of history. But Hannah Martin Luther King was a strong sister by the name of Ella Baker. Ella Baker. Ella Baker. Study her history. She just died the year before last, I think it was. Ella Baker was the strong sister. She's the sister who started SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She was the executive director of SCLC when Dr. King was out there giving all those speeches and all that. She was the one doing the work. She said she didn't want no fame. She didn't want the spotlight. She was a worker. And she, I'm just naming her, but we got millions of them. And just to learn about them, we'll provide strong role models for our little sisters and our brothers. Because sometimes brothers don't know that they're oppressing the sister. They just do it because that's the dominant ideology in the society. Just like maybe there were some Europeans during the time of slavery who had slaves and didn't know that it was incorrect. Maybe they thought that's just how the way it's supposed to be. Maybe some slaves during the time of slavery thought that they were just supposed to be slaves. Maybe that was just the way it was supposed to be. They didn't understand you know, the relationship between those who are oppressed and those who do the oppressing. It's not supposed to be. And many of us understood that and we did fight against it and we got out of this slavery. So now, this mode of production can be divided into a collective or individualist mode. Let's break that one down real quick. Throughout the history of society, there's only been five modes of production. And there's a, a theory, which will be the sixth, but it hasn't been realized yet. The first mode of production, mode of production, mop. <laughs> it can be individualist. Now, let's put collective first. Let's put the positive first. It can be collective or it can be individualist. Individualist. The first economic system, the first mode of production known to human society was called communalism. That's where people live together, like for example, if all of us lived in the same society, if this was our little living compound or our little village, then uh, no individual would own the land. All of us own it collectively. Everything here belongs to us collectively. The education is ours collectively. This was the first. The second, which emerged, was the individualist system called feudalism. Feudalism, that's where you had your tribal chiefs who came to try to, to abuse power. You had some private ownership of the means of production and the service of society. Feudalism is what produced some of these jive kings and queens who thought that they could hand down land to their children. It's in the time of feudalism that we first began to see exploitation of women. During the time of communalism, there was no exploitation of man or woman by any other man or woman. There are still some parts in the world where communalism exists in little small pockets of society. It doesn't dominate any large society <coughs> as of yet. Communalism. The third form to emerge was slavery. You know about slavery. During slavery, those who produce the fruits don't eat the fruits of their labor. Those who reap the fruits don't do the work. Those who do the work don't reap the benefits of the labor. You work from Kent City in the morning to Kent City at night without getting anything. The fourth form of economic system to emerge in human society to this day is just another form of feudalism. It has the same essence of feudalism, the same essence of slavery. The fourth economic system known to man and womankind is called capitalism. Capitalism is just a modern form of slavery. Just like during slavery, those who do the work don't receive the benefits of the labor. During slavery, during slavery you live on a plantation, right? Maybe Mississippi, Alabama, the southern parts of this state. You live on this plantation. You don't own the land. The only thing you have is your labor. You can't even sell your labor. You work all day long, and they give you some food to eat, they give you some clothes to wear, and they give you a little place to sleep, right? So you eat, you sleep, and you have a place to stay, right? All right? During capitalism, when they began to have this industry, these machines, for example, now they came to rearrange the labor so that those people who do the work receive a wage. You become a wage slave. And so with this wage, they tell you, you got to go buy your own food. You got to go buy your own place to live. You got to go buy your own clothes. So that what happens, during the time of slavery, you're working on the DuPont plantation. During the time of capitalism, you work on the DuPont plant. During the time of slavery, during the time of slavery, you had your food to eat, your clothes to wear, you had your place to stay, the DuPont plant. Now, plantation. Now, doing wage labor, you might not be able to find that work. 
But you still gotta go buy your food and your clothes and have a place to stay. And Mr. DuPont still own the apartment you live in. That old run down, ragged and rat infested cockroach. <laughs> now this capitalism, before we go into the fifth, this capitalism, it has other forms. Let me put it over to the side. When the capitalists leave their boundaries, when they leave England, or they leave France, or they leave the United States of America, and they go, for example, to Ghana, or Guinea, or South Africa, or wherever they go, they went all over the world just about. They used to say the, Brit the sun doesn't set on the British Empire. You know what that means? That Britain had so many colonies all around the world, when the sun set here, it was rising there. That's why they say the sun never set on the British Empire, but then they had to come up with another song, London bridges are falling down. <laughs> Capitalism, when they do that, it becomes imperialism. Imperialism, as B. I. Lennon, another great man who made great contributions to human society, even if some people are confused to knock over Lenin's statue in the Soviet Union, doesn't mean that Lenin wasn't a great man and did not make great contributions. He was a great man and made great contributions to human society. More so than most of these job professors sitting up here intellectualized and talking about they know this and they know that, they don't hardly know nothing, haven't done hardly anything. Lenin was a great man. He came to analyze capitalism in its highest phase, called imperialism. It's the highest phase of capitalism, imperialism. Its essence is imperialism, which has its essence in exploitation. Its form is imperialism. Imperialism has the forms of colonialism, it has the forms of settler colonialism, we described that one, and now it has this new form of neo-colonialism. That word neo just meaning new. Kwame Nkrumah came to write another book called Neo-Colonialism, and in this book, Neo-Colonialism, he called it Neo-Colonialism, the last, not the highest, but the last, the final, the last stage of imperialism. This is the big struggle in Africa to this very day. All of Africa, with the exception maybe of Libya and the Zania South Africa, are under neo-colonialism. The exceptions are South Africa because it still is settler colonialism. They're trying to change it to neo-colonialism, like they're in the process of doing in Namibia. Neo-colonialism, that's where they come to during the independence movement in Africa, for example. It could be in Asia and Latin America, too. The peoples want their freedom. All oppressed people will rise up to get their freedom. So what the enemy comes to do, he, come, he or she, mainly he, he comes to say, okay, this is what we'll do. They want their freedom, we're going to give it to them. We'll give them a flag, we'll give them a constitution, we'll give them an African president who looks like them. But we're still going to control the economy. So now all the little children, they go off to school, they pledge allegiance to their new flag. Now instead of having a Union Jack, red, white, and blue, or instead of having that French flag with red, white, and blue, or that American flag, red, white, and blue, now they got their own flag. But in Liberia, for example, it's red, white, and blue, just got one star. <laughs> they, they, they let you know what's happening in Liberia. <laughs> They're not slick about it there. But in other countries, we at least have the red, black, green, and gold. You know what the black star, like those colors over there? Red, black, green, and gold, the colors of Africa. But it's all foreign. The essence still is imperialism. It's even worse now. Because in this stage of neocolonialism, some of the people who at least would struggle against imperialism during the colonial, classic colonial stage, now they have come to join hands with the enemy, with the imperialists, to exploit our own people. So to this very day, we have the scum of Africa who are posing as presidents of African countries. People like Mobutu Sese Seko, the worst African ever born in the history of the whole wide world. <laughs> Mobutu Sese Seko, oh yeah. One of the, let me tell you something else. For some of you who come to school just to get a job to make a lot of money, the amount of money you make doesn't determine your greatness. If that was the case, we wouldn't be praising Martin Luther King today because Martin Luther King didn't die a rich man. He was wealthy in his character. Mobutu Sese Seku is the richest African alive and the worst. The worst scum of the scum. And still it got more money in Zaire, which is really the Congo, than the whole country of Congo, of Zaire. Letting the Zionist Israelis have bases inside of Zaire, giving sometimes bases to South Africa to come attack neighboring countries such as Angola. He's the worst. And George Bush said that he's the best friend America has in Africa. Now, you know Malcolm, he came to tell you, like they said, if they tell you to go east, you should probably go west. So when they come to stand before you and say, Mobutu's their best friend, you gotta say, he must be our worst enemy. <laughs> right? I'll give you a little tip. So. Neocolonialism is dominant in Africa today. It's the last stage. After this comes the fifth economic system known to man and woman. First communalism, second feudalism, third slavery, 
fourth, capitalism has its different forms. Imperialism, which manifests itself, semi-colonialism, neo-colonialism, Zionism, where they came to take the Palestinian people's land. And not only are they enemy of Palestinian people, but they're an enemy of humanity and they're one of the primary enemies of African people. Sometimes people confuse Zionism, a uh, racist, political, imperialist system, with Judaism, a just religion. There's a big difference. Judaism, like Christianity, like Islam, like Buddhism, like any other religion, is a just religion. It's a great religion, just like the rest. But the confusion is that these Zionists, they come to use Jews, some Jews, to confuse them to make them believe that their religion is a race. Can you imagine somebody confusion and make you believe Christianity is a race? <laughs> Where's your homeland? <laughs> Where's the homeland of Christianity? Or, or the Islam is a race? And you say, where's the homeland? That's the confusion that happened with, with uh, Judaism. Up until 1897, when they had the first Zionist conference in Basel, Switzerland, the overwhelming majority of Jews were anti-Zionists. Still up to this day, many Jews are, as a matter of fact, to be a true Jew, you have to be anti-Zionist. Because Zionism, a racist philosophy, comes to shoot down Palestinian children, women, and men in the streets of Palestine. Zionism comes to give, to make Uzis that they send to Zania, South Africa, they kill our brothers and sisters who are in the streets of Zania, South Africa. You saw those little machine guns, they use Uzis, they got them here too. They come out of Israel. Occupy Palestine. Occupy Palestine, Israel on the map, on the Zionist map says that their number one gross national product to this day is diamonds. Their number one, you don't understand gross national product. Their number one gross national product is diamonds. You know how many diamond mines they have in, in Israel? Zero. <laughs> they don't have any. They get it all from Azania, South Africa. So what happens is that Africans in Azania, South Africa, in our land, and all the resources in our land belongs to who? Uh, us. Like, for example, if all of us in this room made up one nation, the resources of this land belong to who? Me as an individual or us as a collective? Us. All of the gold, 80% of the world's gold in Azania, South Africa, 80% of the world's diamonds in Azania, South Africa, or more, and so many strategic resources in Azania, South Africa. You know what happens. We Africans who don't control our land, we work all day long. Matter of fact, they take the men away from the women at least 11 months out of the year to make them dig up the gold, our gold. We load this gold up on, and diamonds onto uh, airplanes and ships. Those Zionist collaborators inside of Zionist South Africa, and I say Zionist collaborators by every extent of me, not, not symbolically. In 1948, when Israel became an illegal state inside of occupied Palestine, was the same year that some of these apartheid laws became formal inside of Zionist South Africa. Some of the leaders of the, the European settlers inside of Zionist South Africa became the first leaders of the government of, of racist, illegal Israel. And so the now what happens is they, we put them on the ships and on the airplanes. It's our goal. Matter of fact, it's our airplanes too, because everything used to make the airplane come from Africa too. Even the rubber. And then they send it up to Israel, Palestinians and other Africans. They have Africans in Palestine too. Take it off of the airplanes. Then they refine it in Israel and they send it where? To New York, London. Inside of New York and London, they have their uh, Zionist connections who have these jewelry stores. They sell this gold and this diamonds. And we Africans who were still wage slaves work from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, sometimes two and three jobs trying to sell our labor just so we can get enough money to go buy this gold and this diamond. And whose gold and diamond was in the very beginning? Ours. So we lose our labor and our resource inside of Africa. We lose our, our labor and resource inside of occupied Palestine, Israel. Then we lose our labor here. And then the money we used to finance them, they used this to build up a big political machinery. What it now, they take the money from the, the gold money that we get them, that we got our labor exploited with, and they buy more Uzis to shoot us down with NSA in South Africa. So we are, are victims and at the same time perpetuating our own oppression because we don't have the information. As Nkrumah say, education is not just the sum total of what man and woman knows, it's what you come to use your education to do. We come to use our education to change some of these backwards philosophies in the world. This capitalism, and it's a force of imperialism, it's the enemy of humanity, which leads us to the fifth known economic system in the history of mankind and womankind, socialism. Are you going to take questions soon? Yes, yes, yes. So socialism. Socialism is to communalism like capitalism is to feudalism. <laughs> communalism in modern society is socialism. If you want to find an ancestor of
of capitalism, you have to go to feudalism, slavery. You want to find the ancestors of socialism, you go to communalism. So as we come to talk about African unity, a quest for African unity, the relationship between peoples of African descent and Africa, we have to find political and economic solutions, ideological solutions to our people's problems. The ideology that we must have must come from our culture. Marxism, Leninism is a valid ideology for the European working class. <laughs> Any revolutionary in the world must defend Marxism, Leninism. It is a great ideology for the European working class. Every ideology comes from the histories of the people. African people have our history. We can take universal aspects of Marxism, Leninism, which are science, which are facts, just like Newton's law is a science, it's a fact, but we must have our own ideology that comes from our history. We propose to name it Nkrumism, Touraism, after the works and, and speeches and writings of Kwame Nkrumah and Seiko Toure. This is the correct ideology of the African Revolution. Just like in China, during the time of the Chinese Revolution, they came to say Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. Mao Zedong, the leader of the revolution in China. Eventually, this would have become an ideology. Mao Zedong thought because it's the people's culture, the people's history. Capitalism is foreign to Africa. Exploitation, that's not African. African is collectivism. When you go back to traditional Africa, you find three basic principles underlying traditional African society. Can I raise this and put that up real quick? All right, then we're going to close it up. Take your time. <laughs> All right, traditional African society. It had three fundamental principles underlying traditional African society. Collectivism. Egalitarianism and humanism. And all these have a materialist base. I'm going to describe all of these real quickly. Okay, collectivism, the belief that for me as an individual to advance, the whole collective must advance. The only way I can advance as a, as a human being, as an individual, is if the collective advance. No individual came up with mathematics to say 2 plus 2 is 4 and 9 divided by 3 is 3. It's a collective process. You cannot learn a language by yourself. You can take the smartest human being in the world, put them in a room by himself or herself, <coughs> give them everything they ask for, they can't create a language. They can't do it. Only the societies do it. This is why African people should be careful. Sometimes they try to make us ashamed that Africa got so many languages. I think we should be very proud that Africa has over 1,800 languages. That's an aspect of the people's culture. Collectivism not only says that the individual should be responsible to the collective, but that the collective should be responsible for each individual. In this room, you all should be concerned about my development as an individual, his development, his individual, his development, her development, each and every one of us development. Because if we have strong individuals, we have a strong collective. An example being a football team. Uh, you can have the greatest athlete in the world on a football team. But the rest of the people on that football team are weak or, or handicapped. <laughs> that one individual can't win the games for them against another team. But if you have a football team where each individual was strong, strong athlete, you have a strong football team. So if we take the collective in this room, each of us as individual is strong, this collective will be strong. In a nutshell, that's collectivism. Egalitarianism comes to tell us, why y'all tell me I did that wrong? Egalitarianism comes to tell us that all Human beings are equal in essence. There are no inferior or superior people. We have different forms, but in essence, we're all equal. Inequality is an opposite to African belief. Humanism comes to tell us, there are different definitions of humanism, but in brief, humanism comes to tell us that man and woman should not simply be a means to an end. I cannot exploit you just for my own benefit. We should not exploit human beings for the benefit of a few individuals. We should be concerned about the development of each individual so that man and woman is an ends within ourselves and a means for social development, not a means to be exploited. That's to say that, for example, we build an organization. We need people to build an organization. But we shouldn't just say, okay, your job is to build this ladder. You know, you do things like you're a slave. No. 
We've come to develop you as an individual, to transform you as an individual, <coughs> to transform myself as an individual, so that we as a society can be transformed. When you have an a anti-collectivist society, an individualist society, that's a change in principle. This principle is an opposite to the principle of collectivism. Same thing with inequality. It's an opposite with the principle of egalitarianism. The same thing with, with exploitation. It's an opposite to the principle of humanism. To transform these principles to these principles, or these principles back to these principles, it requires a complete transformation. This complete transformation of principle, it generically is called revolution. To go from a slave society to a free society requires a revolution. To go from an individualist society to a collectivist society requires a revolution. To go from an anti-humanist society, an exploitative society, where men and women will be killed just for profit, it requires to go from this to an egalitarian humanist society, a revolution. A revolution is not an event. It's not where you pick up the guns, overthrow the government, the next day you got a revolution. No. Revolution is a process. To take peoples who have been imbued with individualist ideology, transform us to collectivist people requires revolution, a process. We must become new women and men. We must become transformed. Revolution, then, is it negative or positive? Positive. Is it negative or positive? Revolution. Positive. It's positive. I ask you this question because on TV, I, I see when they come with these new copy machines, they say they got a revolutionary breakthrough. <laughs> I hear them talk about the glorious French Revolution, the glorious American Revolution, but when you say African Revolution, it's like, ugh, everybody gets scared, like you want to eat people or something like that. If, if revolution is good for Europeans, it's good for Asians, it's good for Africans, too. Yes, that's what we need. Revolution. Reform won't do it. <coughs> Capitalism is the reform of slavery. Slavery is the reform of feudalism. Reform keeps the same principle, it just changes its, its uh, form. Same essence. This is what they want us to buy in America. Reform. But America will have revolution. Because there are many oppressed peoples, not just Africans, in America. And all these oppressed people, as they come to be conscious, they're going to overthrow those who are sitting on top of their necks. All of these principles have their base in what is called materialism. Materialism, let's explain this one. That's not, you know, you gotta wanna have a nice car, a nice house. No, that's, mater that's another type of materialist person. This materialism comes to say that matter is primary. Everything that exists in the whole wide world comes from matter. Even spirit. Spirit comes from matter. Like for a good, a good example, school spirit. What's the name of the football team? The Hawkeyes, right? <laughs> <laughs> University. It didn't just come from the sky. First, they had to build up the school. They had to put teachers in here, have students, have a curriculum. Then they said, let's give the students school spirit. Let's have them, pri have, them have pride in their school. And so much so, sometimes they have, people have so much spirit that when this school comes to play football, a game against this school, they have fights because their spirit is so strong. <laughs> <laughs> so spirit itself even has its base in matter. Another example of transformation of matter, how do you give spirit from matter, for example? Same way, you, you, when you study physics, or, or chemistry, right? you, you study that you have uh, H2O equals water. If you take this water, which is a matter, because hydrogen is a matter, oxygen is a matter, you take those two hydrogens and one oxygen, and you put it inside of a pot, or a test tube, and you put a catalyst under that, like fire, it will reach a critical state, which is 100 degrees centigrade, it will change its category. It will change from a category of a liquid to one of gas from water to stain. But the base is matter. Even if we don't see in this room, you know, this, this space, but even this space is oxygen. Oxygen is just two, I'm sorry, just one oxygen. It's a matter. It has a material base. Everything comes from matter. And this matter is capable of self-motion. Even inside this chalkboard, there are electrons and protons that are all the time moving against each other. Matter is capable of self-motion. Do you know that this philosophy is a philosophy underlying traditional African beliefs? So the now traditional African beliefs have these three basic principles that have a materialist base. This material base, this traditional African experience, is part of our culture. It's a part of our ideology. These philosophies come to make up ideology. So that 
Karl Marx didn't invent socialism, or he didn't invent collectivism. Karl Marx came to make analysis. Just like Newton didn't invent gravity, the laws of gravity. He just discovered them. He could not invent that this chalk is going to fall to the ground at a rate of 32 feet per second square per second square. <laughs> All you can do is observe it. No matter where he goes, any other person can observe it. He doesn't come up with the same conclusion. It's science. When we study human beings, we should study the science of human beings also. So these are the principles. If these principles underlie traditional African society, if Africa had never been dominated by foreigners, these principles would still be in existence and they would dominate our society. This ideology would still dominate our society. But we were dominated by foreigners and still are. So that these, these uh, principles have been repressed. So because of this, this is why we need revolution. If it had not happened, we would just need evolution. <coughs> if there were no foreign dominators in African society, in American Indian society, to arrive at these principles, we would not need revolution. We would just need evolution, a more gradual process. But evolution is always wasteful. Evolution is always wasteful in human lives and talent. Therefore, we speed up this evolutionary process with knowledge and information. It's a revolution. Revolution, then, is a very positive thing. A person who becomes a revolutionary comes to transform his or her life, comes to give his or her life a service to his or her people. Uh, che Guevara said that a revolutionary, after all, is one who has more love for the masses of his, uh, undying love for the mass of his or her people. That's what drives the revolution, not violence, not all that. No, we have love for our people, and we'll crush anything that gets in the way of our people's victory and advance humanity. We have to be careful here. This egalitarianism comes to tell us that all peoples are equal in essence. Some of us, coming out of 500 years of slave, terrorist, capitalist terrorism, come to have an awakening, come to find out our African history, we become very proud. We come to find out Africa gave the world the first universities, greater than this university. Africa gave the world the first books, the first languages, the first culture, the first this, greatness, first doctors. We become so excited, we say, how could they have all this from us? Some of us go from an inferiority complex to a superiority complex. Even sometimes, we have to be careful. Some words that they come to give us sound positive, sound like they're in tune with our culture, but they're against our culture. One word I want to caution you on is a word called Afrocentricity. When you hear that word, you would think that it means, oh, view the world from an African perspective, you know, that African people are people too. But no. Afrocentricity even sometimes can, can be fused with Pan-Africanism. But Afrocentricity is actually a reaction to Eurocentricity. Any of these centricities, Asian centricity or Eurocentricity, comes to view the world from your perspective, and your perspective as being the center of the whole world. That is to say that you view yourself as being superior and the rest of the people being inferior. So that when the Europeans, those, the imperialist class of Europeans, those who left the borders of Europe, who went to Asia, Africa, and America, they came to view people and they had to justify how they would colonize these people. So they went back to Europe and they lied. They used propaganda. Propaganda is the strongest weapon in the world, you know. It's propaganda. They told the mass of Europeans that Asians <coughs> were inferior because they didn't have a society like Europeans. And so the, the job of the Europeans was to go civilize them. They came to say that their job to come to Africa was to civilize us. How can another people leave anywhere and go civilize another people? All people have their civilization. <laughs> and civilization is not judged by big buildings or big cars or big bombs. Because you can have a, a society that has the highest techno technological development and still be one of the most uncivilized societies. Like America. <laughs> because now, now these societies, for example, in America, people are scared to go out on the streets. Most women, it'd be, it, it's almost unthoughtful you walk down the street by yourself at 3 o'clock in the morning. But even in Africa and other parts of the world, like where I live in Guinea Bissau, it's nothing for a sister to walk down the street at 3 o'clock in the morning, no problem. People sit out on the streets, children play free, come out and come back at 11 o'clock at night. You're like, what, 11 o'clock at night, children? No problem. They don't hear anything about molestation. They're civilized. American Indians are very civilized. <laughs> How civilized? When has Africa ever left its boys to go bomb anybody else? <laughs> never. When did American Indians ever leave America to go bomb Europe? They never did it. Civilization is not the question of who has the big building. This is very important for Africa, for African unity. It's we quest for African unity. Because there's a big debate going on right now in Africa. You got some big Uncle Tom, big old neocolonial puppets like Herbert Felix Boigny of Ivory Coast. They call it Cote d'Ivoire in French. During the time of this big movement where Kwame Nkrumah's secretary was seriously making strides toward African unity, he was fighting every step of the way. Now even he has to say he's for African unity because 
the masses of people for African unity. He know just for him to survive, he got to say he's for it, even though he's against it. In these days now, they want to look at a place like Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, with Herbert Phillips Boigny is just like the lackey, the puppet of imperialism. He builds these big buildings. Even during the time of colonial, they build these big buildings, got these big shiny streets and all that. Then they want to go look at a country like Guinea Conakry, where Seiko Toure, the first president of Guinea, <laughs> who came to power in 1958 on September the 28th. In 1958, the peoples of Guinea said no to colonialism. September 28th. Seiko Toure, he said, we're going to put emphasis on developing the people. Forget about the big buildings and the streets. You, met, you, you paved the street this year, it rains, the people drive over, it has potholes, it's messed up next year. Let's develop the consciousness of our people. And Guinea Conakry is very rich up to this very day. Bauxite, gold, et cetera, diamonds, ah, oh, big diamonds. But he said, let's develop the people. So now you got Ivory Coast with all these big buildings, these big cars, the people's consciousness is not that very high. Of course, it's rising all the time. But you got Guinea Conakry with hardly any big buildings for the high conscious level. Which one is the most developed? Guinea Conakry or Ivory Coast? If big buildings was the symbol of civilization, then South Africa would be the most civilized country in Africa today because they got the biggest buildings and the biggest streets. <laughs> civilization development is not determined by the buildings. It's determined by the consciousness of the people. <coughs> so this word Afrocentricity, that's what we got on this one. Afrocentricity, although it sounds like it's for us, it's really against us. Afrocentricity begins to say by many scholars, those who write like this latest book by Asante on Afrocentricity, he comes to tell us that, um, that uh, Arabs are our enemies, that Islam is our enemy, that Europeans are our enemy. He comes to tell us that African people are like a superior people. This is not true. That's anti-African. African, traditional African society, one of the fundamental principles underlying traditional African society is egalitarianism. Some of these people who propose this word Afrocentricity say that Afrocentricity is against materialism. They say that materialism is a European concept. Materialism is just as much African as collectivism, egalitarianism, and humanism. Materialism was not, was not invented by Karl Marx. It was invented by African people. It was invented by human societies. Africa made the first contribution in this area, Africa being the over civil, oldest civilization in the world. Sometimes Afrocentricity comes to take an undialectical approach to history. It comes to not to even look at the class struggle. Remember, the class struggle is one of the primary motivating forces of history. The relationship between man and woman and the modes of production is the driving force of history. But this word, this, this uh, tendency of this concept of Afrocentricity does not even look at the question of the class struggle. They come to tell us that our struggle is primarily a race struggle. So backwards is that theory, I'll give you a good example. If that were the case, then we would come to look at Clarence Thomas as being more of our ally than Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro is not African, but Fidel Castro is more of our ally to this day and, and always would be more our ally than Clarence Thomas ever will be. Clarence Thomas has skin like us, but he doesn't have ideas like us. Matter of fact, we need to take away his African citizenship. Just like we need, <laughs> just like we need to take away Mobutu's African citizenship. Yeah, it's because African is not just somebody you look at and you say, oh, that's an African. Africans, it come, our being Africans come from our historical, sociological, and biological experiences. So Clarence Thomas biologically was born African, but he's not an African this day. At least he's not a good African anyway. <laughs> Mabutu is. So Afrocentrism, you got to be careful with these words. Because anytime the enemy, and we do have enemies, anytime the enemy sees the people moving, sometimes what they do to slow us up, they don't say, I'm against you. Even the Ku Klux Klan doesn't get on TV and say, I hate niggers no more. They don't do that. They put on their business suits and they do it subtly. So they stab you in the back while you, while you think they're their friend. Well, that's how the enemy works. If they see that Africans are becoming awakened and Africans are being proud of being Africa, then they know that the next step is that these Africans all over the world who love ourselves will come to find out more about ourselves. And the more we come to find out about ourselves, the more we will come to love ourselves. And the more we come to love ourselves, the more we will work for ourselves. And the more we work for ourselves, the more we will know ourselves. And the more we know ourselves, the more we will love ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They know what will happen. These African peoples, peoples of Africans, and Africans, we don't have to say peoples of Africans, we're Africans. You don't say people of French, they say you're French. Peoples of Africa, Africans. Africans, as we come to learn our history, we come to love ourselves. And as we come to love ourselves, we gravitate toward each other. It's only natural that African people will unite. Evolutionary. It would happen, it would happen by evolution. But this evolution is a gradual process and wasteful in human lives and talents. 
Our job is to come to get information, to get knowledge, to speed up the process by revolution. This is our job. Revolution cannot be done by one individual. If it could have, I'd have did it yesterday, a long time ago. <laughs> revolution must be guided by organization. The primary problem we have as a people is that we don't control our land, therefore we don't control the institutions on our land like the schools. That's why it's no accident, even though we still are mad about it, it's no accident that you don't learn about Malcolm X truly, or Kwame Nkrumah, or Mio Kakabra, and Balia Kamara, et cetera, et cetera, in these institutions. You don't control the land. You don't control the institutions. Even in Africa, we still aren't masters in our own land. We don't control the institutions. Every conscious person who loves his or herself wants to see his or her people free. So African people, to speed up this process, we need those of us who have access to this information to get this information and speed up the process. Revolution is a process, not an event. Revolution, historically, by all peoples, is carried out by three classes, three sectors. The workers, the peasants, and the revolutionary intelligentsia. The workers, the peasants, and the revolutionary intelligentsia. The first class, not the most important class, is the intelligentsia. The intelligentsia, those people know how to read and write, how to get information, how to think, how to analyze, etc. African people have more than 80-some percent of our people who are illiterate, but these people are intelligent. 80% of the population of African people is peasantry, who, who live on the land. We have a small working class, but we have a working class. Many of these people in this working class, this peasantry class, don't know how to read or write, but they're intelligent. They know about justice. The big problem we have as African people is that the intelligentsia class, which most of us fall into, the intelligentsia class of African people is the most corrupt in the world. I hate to say it, but it's true. The most corrupt intelligence in the world is African intelligentsia. It's really a shame when you go to a country in Africa and you see this big bourgeoisie living in this big old mansion driving around all these long Mercedes Benz, got the airplane, and everybody around them starving. The bourgeoisie, the intellectuals, the African intelligentsia are the most corrupt. But they're exceptions. These people we have on the wall are exceptions. These represent the revolutionary intelligentsia. Those people who come from the intelligentsia class, who know how to read and write, who understand that the purpose of this education is to advance humanity, to advance the people's cause. It's a difficult process. We're imbued with backwards ideas every day in this university. It's a battle over ideas. That's what is meant by ideological struggle, a struggle over ideas. When somebody's trying to struggle with you, make you individuals, you struggle against them to become collectivists. That's a battle of ideas. These universities exist to give you backwards ideas, to make you become individualists, to make you cadre of the capitalist system, so that you will come to perpetuate this system of exploitation called capitalism. Our job, those of us who really love our people, is to become revolutionary intelligentsia. Our sisters must be on the forefront here, because our sisters, unlike us brothers, are oppressed triply. Like Karl Marx came to say, you lift up the bottom class, you get the rest. Our sisters have had a historical experience during the time of communal Africa where we didn't have exploitation, where we led societies with justice. Our sisters are the first ones to have to imbue ideas on our children. Our sisters, the only way they find their equality is on the front lines of the struggles against our enemies. If you look at any of these countries in Africa, as a matter of fact, any oppressed people in the world, if you want to see when the sisters really made that game, their progress, the most expedient progress is on the front lines of the struggle. So we call on our African sisters to live out your role, to learn about your mouths and be a great example, even greater than Harriet Tubman, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Secretary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As we close, we have to leave you one more thing. Our fundamental problem as a people, as African people, are that we are disorganized. We don't control our society. Inside of your house, you might have your house organized, a place for your underwear, a place for your socks, etc. You might have your class notes organized. But if your people are not organized, you will never have power. The only way we will have power is when our people are organized. It's not just important to organize the people, it's necessary. It's a necessity. If a house way across town was on fire and you saw the fire truck going, you say, well, it's important that the firemen put out the fire. But if this room was on fire and your baby's in this room, it's necessary for you to get the baby out and then put out the fire. It's a necessity. You might have to use the bathroom, you might be hungry, you forget about all that. Your number one priority is to rescue your baby. Organization is not just important. Organization is a necessity. Mass organization. 
One of the lessons we must learn from the Soviet Union in their attempt to, or, to build socialism with a vanguard party. You know what it's meant by a vanguard party? A party where they say we're going to take the best of our children, we'll put them into a party, and their job is to lead the society. That's what vanguard on the front line, on the front, the forefront. We must build mass organization. Anybody who's on the vanguard, your job is not to lead the society. Your job is to politically educate those other two sectors, politically educate the peasants and the workers. When you politically educate these peasants and workers, they themselves will get inside of this organization and they will control the organization. Then it will truly be a mass organization. You build a vanguard party, the risk you run, and the risk that I think, the mistake that I think was made in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc was that these vanguard parties, some of them had too much power in their individual hands. Members of these central committees sat on top of the power and thought the struggle was over with, and now they're just going to call the shots. The, the revolution is a process. The role of the vanguard.